the Lord. Greet everybody here in the name of Jesus and uh, welcome to uh, Amos Lake Church today. We're going to be sharing with you today from John chapter 9 about the uh, man that was born blind. And uh, I don't know what to title this per se. I, I usually have a, a classy title that gets your eyes and I never could think of one today. So uh, I'm just going to call this uh, How the Blind See. How the Blind See. Yeah, I think it'll work out here. And in John chapter 9 and verse 1, it said, And Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sinned, nor his parents, but that the works of God should be manif made manifest in him, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And when he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle and anointed the eyes of the blind man with clay. And he said unto him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation sent. He went his way, therefore, and washed and came seeing. The neighbors, therefore, and they which had seen him that was blind, said, Is not this he that sat and begged? And some said, This is he. And others said, He is like him. But he said, I am he. Therefore said they unto him, How were thine eyes opened? He answered and said, A man that is called Jesus made clay, anointed my eyes, and said unto me, Go wash in the pool of Siloam. And I went and washed and received sight. Praise the Lord. Now, we've got a man here who is uh, blind from birth. Now, this is not a temporary problem. This is not someone saying, well, I've got a headache and, I, and God healed me. And I'm not making fun of that because how many have had a headache and God has healed you? I, I'm one of them. Okay, Many times you have had a headache and went to God and it just left like that. And, and that's a great, wonderful thing. But you know, if you have a headache and you get healed, people say, oh yeah, well, that's no big deal, you know, kind of thing. But this is something, a man is born blind. He's born that way. And it's indisputable. Everybody knows he was blind that way. He spent his whole life being blind. They all seen him begging. They knew for a fact that he was blind. And so there's no sleight of hand going on here. There's no trickery. And you know, anytime there's a miracle, the religious folk are always suspicious. You ever notice that? That some people, when a miracle happens, they get so excited and they start to praise God. And then the religious people come along and say, well, that's a trickery. He wasn't really sick or, or you know, he's just faking it or there's, that's an old video or, you know, they just find all kinds of reason not to believe. And religion will always do that. And uh, God is looking for faith and not religion. Amen. So here's a man where there can be absolutely no dispute that he was blind and blind from birth. Now, the big question is asked here, which man sinned? Did this man sin or did his parents sin? And you know, we're always asking that question when something happens, aren't we? I mean, every one of us in this room has asked that question when something bad happens. It's, it's a big theological question. Why do bad things happen to good people? Or why do bad things happen at all, whether you're good or not? We always want to know why. And so we're trying to assign some blame or responsibility. Well, who sinned? Was it this man that sinned? Or was it his parents that sinned? Because somebody must have sinned here. And uh, Jesus answers that question and said, well, neither this man sinned nor his parents. Now, if you think about it, it would be pretty hard for that man to have sinned inside of his mother's womb. I mean, can you imagine that little fetus bouncing around in his mummy's belly? I think I'll rob a bank today. <laughs> I think I'll commit adultery. <laughs> or something like that. No, that, that baby could not sin. Sin is transgression of the law. I don't even know that there's a law. How many of you remember being in the womb? Not one of you. <laughs> you think you do. You were in the egg, Big Bird. <laughs> I mean, we don't remember being in the womb because we weren't conscious of it. So it's obvious that 
This man, if he was born blind, he really couldn't have done nothing to, to, <laughs> to warrant it. And now, I, I want here's a little side thought here. Sometimes, sometimes, stuff happens because of sin, doesn't it? Remember the man that was healed at the pool and Jesus came along after he was healed and said, sin no more, lest the worst thing come upon you? Well, that's the case sometimes. Not all the time, but sometimes. And you know, whenever you read your Bible, it's common sense and, 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 and smart to don't try to take one story of the Bible and make the lesson that's taught there the rule for every other thing. There are cases where certain things apply in certain situations. And they don't apply in the next situation. In this story, God tells the man, go and wash in the pool of Siloam. You know, he didn't say that to blind Bartimaeus, did he? No. See, I mean, some religion will build a rule and say, well, if you want to be healed, you're going to have to go and wash in the pool of Siloam every time. Well, that's what religion will do. It'll, it'll camp around one truth and ignore all the rest of the truth. And so here we have a situation where Jesus tells him, go wash in the pool of Siloam. And he did that and was healed. And the next time, Jesus just heals the person. And that's it. Touches their eyes or whatever. And so the question here, if we looked at the parents, Jesus said they didn't sin. And uh, interestingly here, I'm going to ask you a question. Could his parents have died on the cross for your sin? <laughs> no, he, they, they could not. Now, had his parents ever sinned? Had they ever lied, maybe, or something like that? Of course they have. Romans 3.23 says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Everybody. But what Jesus is saying, it wasn't any particular sin that this man did or his parents did that caused him to be born blind. Okay? And, and don't go looking at people if they got some defect or something wrong with them thinking, well, your parents must have sinned. <laughs> or you did something bad and that's why that happened to you. Because it's not necessarily the case. You know, sometimes you do something and stuff happens. Okay, there's sowing and reaping, but not every time. I've done lots of things and never got a crop out of it. I always pray now for crop failure when I do something wrong. Amen. I'm getting, I'm getting off topic, but it's okay. Sometimes I'll do something stupid. Now, none of you have ever done anything stupid in here. Okay, I'm the only one. Because you guys are so much smarter than I am. But sometimes I'll do something stupid and I'll say, Oh God, why did I do that? And I say, say Lord, please, I want crop failure right here. I don't want to reap anything from that thing I just did. I repent. Forgive me. And you know, you avoid a lot of bad crop that way. Amen. You know, and, and sometimes you keep doing the same thing. There's repercussions. You keep smoking and don't be surprised one day if you go to the doctor and you find out you got cancer. Oh, how come God put this cancer on me? He didn't put cancer on you. But you see, sometimes that sowing, sowing, and sowing eventually causes some reaping to happen. So that happens sometimes. So I, I, I just want to work on this a little bit here and make you realize that in this particular passage, the man had not done anything bad himself, nor had his parents that caused his blindness to happen. But yes, the man was just like you and me, imperfect, human being, and uh, sometimes, uh, I, I want to just share a couple of scriptures here with you. Uh, the reason they ask this question is in the Old Testament in Exodus chapter 20, verse 5. You remember the Ten Commandments are in Exodus 20, not the Ten Suggestions, but the Ten Commandments? They're there. <laughs> okay, there were Ten Commandments for the Jewish people, and uh, all of the commandments for us in the New Testament are, are summed up in one. You'll love, or two, basically, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And then you don't have to worry about the Ten Commandments, because if you do that, they'll all just automatically be kept. Amen. Then that's how we, that's how we keep the commandments. We love God and we love one another. But you see, in the Old Testament, in the, in the commandment about idolatry, that third commandment, he says, uh, I, I, the Lord, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquities of the fathers upon the children under the third and fourth generations of them that hate me and showing mercy unto thousands of them who love me and keep my commandments. So that's why they're asking the question. 
See, they, they know that this is part of the Old Testament, so they're asking who sinned. Because they know that in the Old Testament, if you were an idolater at least, God would visit those iniquities to the third and fourth generation of those who hated him. So that's why they asked the question. And then in Ezekiel, there's another passage, 18 verses 2 to 3. And God speaks to Ezekiel and to the nation of Israel and he says, What mean ye that use this proverb concerning the land of Israel, saying, here's the proverb, The fathers have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. As I live, says the Lord God, you shall not have occasion anymore to use this proverb in Israel. Now, I don't know if you ever ate sour grapes, but if you ever eat a sour grape or something, your teeth go, eh. Ever eat something sour? Get a lemon and start biting on it or something like that, and it sets your teeth on edge. Well, the Proverbs were, the fathers ate sour grapes, but now the children are suffering because of what they did. Can you imagine sitting across the table from your kid, and every time you eat a, a sour grape, your kid goes, ow! <laughs> I'll fix you. Ow! <laughs> And, and God said, you're never going to use that proverb anymore. Because, And then in Jeremiah 31, 30, he says, But everyone shall die for his own iniquity. Every man that eats the sour grape, his own teeth will be set on edge. And that's how he's going to deal with us today. Amen? He's, dealing, he's talking about the new covenant that was coming. You eat sour grapes, your own teeth will get set on edge. Not your children's. So back to this man. Uh, Jesus said, Neither he nor his parents sinned. And uh, we know that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, but nothing specific was done that did that. Now, there's some comfort here to any parent that's had a child and, and they've got some kind of disability or some kind of abnormality or something that's wrong that, that happened physically to them. There's a little bit of comfort here. God is not punishing you. Amen. God not punishing you. Well, why do these things happen? I, I'm going to share something with you. I wrestled with this as a young Christian. As a young Christian. I wasn't even in the ministry yet. And I was praying and thinking about this. Because I always would ask these hard questions about stuff. And uh, I had a, I don't know if it was a dream or a vision. I really don't know what it was. And again, I, I'm not trying to base theology on visions. But I was praying about this. And, and I was on the farm. And... Uh, in fact, I was at the farm when it happened, and, and uh, we had this well, and, and the water was coming out of the well, and it was nice, clean water. And I remember taking this five-gallon pail and filling it up with water that came from the well. And when I filled it up with water, you know, there was all this rust inside the pail, and it was swirling around, and then I poured out the, the pail into a, into a trough, and there was all this water, but there was this rust and, and stuff mixed up with the water. And the Lord showed me that he uses imperfect people to create imperfect people. In other words, your grandparents were imperfect and they gave birth to your imperfect parents. And your parents were imperfect and they give birth to you and you're imperfect. And you're imperfect people and you're giving birth to your own children and they're not perfect. And they're going to give birth to children to your grandchildren. And they're not going to be perfect either. Because they're all going to carry within themselves this thing that happened back in the garden. Which was, uh, in the day you eat thereof, you shall surely die. And uh, all of us are on a clock. And, and there's human beings not being perfect pass on stuff sometimes. Okay? And it's just the way that the world is. One day, that'll all be cured. And if, if, if your children have something physically wrong with them now, when the resurrection happens, they're not going to be rolling around heaven in a wheelchair. Hello. Amen. Nobody's going to be walking around heaven. I mean, you can get healed here, and I've seen it happen many times. But if for any reason you don't get healed in this life, I guarantee you when the trumpet sounds and God says, Come up hither, the wheelchairs and the crutches and the black glasses are staying behind. Come on. I mean, God has a cure for that. And, and that doesn't mean we don't pray for people and believe God for healing now. I mean, I believe in healing. I pray for people for healing. I've seen people healed. Amazing healings. But I'll be honest with you, not everybody I ever prayed for has been healed. I'd love it if 100% of the people, 100% of the time got well. Wouldn't that be nice? Wouldn't that be lovely? I've told God that. 
And he said, I didn't ask you for advice. So I have to accept that. Amen. If it was up to me, well, every person would get healed every single time. But it's not up to me. And you know how much is up to me? That much. Nothing. Amen. He just says, you just preach the word and pray for people and let me be God. So that's what I do. Amen. And that's what you should do. So we live in a world that's under the sentence of death and stuff happens. And uh, God has intervenes from time to time. And Jesus answers this. He says that the works of God should be manifest in him. What was the works of God? The works of God in this case was that his eyes would be opened and that he would see and that he would be able to be a revealer of Jesus Christ in the world. Now, works of God are believing on the Messiah. And if you go down to verse 32, there's an interesting verse in verse 32 of chapter 9. And the blind man's testifying. He said, since the world began... Was it not heard that any man opened the eyes of one that was born blind? And that's just a fact. If you go through your Bible, you'll find that no blind people were ever healed until Jesus came along. Not one. When Jesus came along, the blind saw. And then he gave authority over to his disciples. And miracles like that happened. But none of these things ever happened until Jesus came. That would be a sign to Israel that the Messiah had come. That he would give recovery of sight to the blind. Isaiah 29 verse 18 says that the eyes of the blind shall be opened. That was a prophecy. And so Jesus uses two phrases here. He says, uh, while it is day, while it is day, uh, I must work the works of him that sent me. The night comes when no man can work. Now day is light and night is dark, isn't it? And Jesus says, I'm the light of the world. Over in Matthew 5, 14, he speaks to his uh, disciples and the people listening. And he says, you are the light of the world. And the only reason you can be the light of the world is if he lights you up. He's got, he's got to get on the inside of you and light you up. Amen. Otherwise, if the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Amen. You want to have black light? I used to have all this black light when I was a teenager. And I had all these posters, black light posters on the wall. And sometimes I like, used to like to get a, a, a big old joint and smoke that and turn on the black light and the music and look around. And I'd had strobe lights and all this kind of stuff. And, and I used to think this was pretty cool. And I used to do stuff like that. The light in me was darkness at that time. It was a light, but it was a black light, a dark light. But now the light inside of me is the Holy Ghost. And I'm the light of the world now. So are you. Jesus is the light of the world, but because he's in us, he lights us up. So we now become the light of the world. Now, John chapter 1, verse 9, at the beginning of the Gospel of John, it says, That was the true light that lighteth every one that cometh into the world. How many here have come into the world? Did you come in? Everyone? Jesus is the, the light for every single one. No, the Lord doesn't say, Eeny, meeny, miny, mo, off to heaven you will go. Eeny, meeny, my, oh well, I guess you'll have to go to hell. No, no it's not like that. <laughs> Aren't you glad? Yes. Amen. Yes. He's the light that lights every man that comes into the world. Yes. Praise the Lord. Yes. Now, so Jesus now, he makes spit and clay. And Jesus wasn't worried about COVID. Can you imagine if I did that day? Oh, get away from me, pastor. You're going to give me COVID, you know. <laughs> Jesus goes, poof. He spits on the ground and mix up that dust. Puts it on the guy's eyes. And he's got paste all over his eyes. He said, now go to, to the pool of Siloam and wash. Go to the pool. So this man does it. Now it's interesting that man is made from the dust of the earth. If you don't believe that, just go dig up anybody that's died a couple hundred years ago and you'll find a, maybe find some bones and that's it. The rest will have gone right back to dust. Mm -hmm. Give it a couple thousand years, you won't even find the bones probably. You're made from the dust, and from dust you come, and to dust you go back. So it's interesting that Jesus takes some dust of the earth, spits on it, puts it on his eyes. Did he make a new eyeball? I don't know. Maybe he did, maybe he didn't. 
But whatever he did, the man came again seeing. It's interesting that God takes the same stuff we're made out of and uses that to heal this man. Didn't do it every time, but he did it this time. Now, not every blind person Jesus healed was told to do this. Go and wash here was a requirement. Well, what if he hadn't done it? What if he just said, I don't know, that pool of Siloam is too far. There's water right here. I'll just wash here. I don't want to go all the way down there and pay somebody to take me by the hand down to the pool of Siloam. I got water right here. I'll just wash it off here. You know, a lot of people are like that. God tells them to do something and they come up with a better idea and it doesn't work. Jesus said, go and wash in the pool of Siloam. Remember Naaman. He wanted, you know, the prophet to come out and wave his hand and do that. He didn't even bother him. He said, just go down to the Jordan and dip in it seven times. And Naaman was unhappy about that. Well, I thought he'd come out and strike his hand over my leprosy and I'd be healed like that. He, he didn't even bother him. He said, just go down and dip in the pool. Jordan, seven times. Wow, we got better rivers in Syria than the Jordan. Who wants to go in that dirty old river and we got a nice clean river in Syria. Maybe I'll just go there. Maybe I won't dip at all. Well, what if he'd have gone in there and dipped once and, well, I still got leprosy. Dipped twice, I still got leprosy. Dipped a third time, wah, my skin's still ugly. Ah, forget it, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. He's a false prophet. <laughs> Even though he had to dip seven times because that's what he was told to do. Sometimes God asks you to do stuff and it don't make sense. There's stuff that God had asked me to do and made me go through it. And I'm going, God, why do you make me go through all this? Why don't you just, you did it for Eddie over there. <laughs> Eddie don't have to go through all this. He says, you're not Eddie. <laughs> Come on. Come on. God deals with you as individuals. He might ask you to do something and not ask your neighbor to do it. Don't question him. Just obey him. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Uh, Lester Summerall. I remember reading his book and I had the privilege of hearing Lester Summerall before he passed away. And he was dying in a sick bed, dying. I believe it was tuberculosis he had, dying from this disease. And he had a vision. And on one side there was a Bible and on the other side there was a coffin. And then the Lord said, either preach or go to hell. He said, I'll preach. Someone said, well, that vision couldn't have been of God. <laughs> well, maybe God doesn't tell you the same thing. But for Lester, it was preach or go to hell. Take your pick. He said, I'll preach. He lived to be off into his 80s. Hallelujah. See, God don't deal with everybody the same way. But you see, when God gives you something to obey, you listen to him and you obey. This man was told, go wash in the pool. So he went and washed and he came again seeing. Now we get to verse uh, 8. The neighbors, therefore, and they which before had seen him that was blind said, is not this not him that sat and begged? And some said, well, this is he. And others said, he's, not, he's like him. But he said, no, I'm he. Therefore they said unto him, how were thine eyes opened? That same question is going to get asked four times. They're going to ask this same question four different times. How were thine eyes opened? And he answered and said, a man that is called Jesus made clay and anointed mine eyes and said unto me, go to the pool of Siloam and wash. And I went and washed and I received sight. Then said they unto him, where is he? He says, I don't know. They brought him to the Pharisees, him that was aforetime was blind. And it was the Sabbath day when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. And again, the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. That's the second time. And he said unto them, he put clay upon my eyes and I washed and I do see. Therefore said some of the Pharisees, this man is not of God because he keepeth not the Sabbath day. Others said, how can a man that's a sinner do such miracles? And there was a division amongst them. Now, it's interesting. Religion will blind you. Wrong teaching will blind you. I mean, you get taught something wrongly, it takes a long time to get taught rightly. Because in your mind, you're thinking, no, I, brother so-and-so taught me this, and he, that's brother so-and-so. He's got to be right. I mean, he's got a BA and an MA and a PhD, and I mean, he just... You know, he must be right. Well, I got a BA. That's called born again. And I got an MA, more anointing. And one of these days I'm going to get my PhD. That's my prayer, healing, and deliverance. <laughs> no, I, I do have a master's degree. I don't have a PhD yet. Amen. I might get one one of these days if I get time. But I'm going to keep preaching anyway in spite of it. So Jesus had the habit 
this bad habit. You know, the Lord had bad habits of healing people on the Sabbath. It never says in the Bible, and it was a Tuesday. <laughs> never says that. It always mentions it's a Sabbath when he heals. There's seven healings that took place on the Sabbath. Uh, Matthew chapter 12 and verse 10, there's a man with a withered hand in the synagogue. And Jesus heals him on the Sabbath, and they get mad about it. Then over in Luke chapter 13, verses 10 through 17, there's a woman with a hunchback. And she gets healed on the Sabbath. And they get mad about that. And then there's Peter's mother-in-law over in uh, Mark chapter 1, verse 29 through 31. You know that Peter had a mother-in-law. What does that mean? It means that Peter had a wife, right? It means that Peter, the first pope, had a wife. Come on. Well, you know, a priest can't be married. Well, what about Peter? He's the first pope and he had a wife. It was okay for him, wasn't it? He went into his wife's mother who was sick with a fever <laughs> on the Sabbath day, took her by the hand, rebuked the fever, and rose her up. And she was well. Praise the Lord. Amen. Well, if Peter could have a wife, I didn't figure that uh, it would be wrong to have one. So I'm glad I got one. Amen? Amen. How many that got a wife are glad you got one? Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. We'll pray for those of you that didn't think it was good. Amen. All right. <laughs> And then in Mark chapter uh, 1, verse 21 through 28, there's a man in the synagogue and he's possessed with devils. He's demon possessed. I know who you are. You're the Holy One of God. And Jesus says, shut up, come out. It's a Sabbath. Then over in John chapter 5, verses 1 through 8, there's the lame man at the pool of Bethesda waiting to get in the pool when the water was troubled. And Jesus asked him, do you want to be well? Probably a, a question that, uh, you know... <laughs> It's obvious. And he heals him on the Sabbath. And then everybody's mad because he gets healed on the Sabbath. And then over here, uh, it, this one here, this man that's born blind, gets healed on the Sabbath. And they say, this man cannot be of God because he's not keeping the Sabbath. He's healing people on the Sabbath. Why doesn't he come around here on a Sunday or a Friday and do his miracles and leave the Sabbath alone? It's a holy day. You're not supposed to have any work on the Sabbath. See, religion will do that. I remember going to Israel. And I was in this hotel. And, and things are a little different in Israel. They still keep the Sabbath there. And, and it's kind of weird because it's a little backwards to what you imagine. But on the Sabbath, you're not allowed to take the elevator. You've got to take the stairs. Why, I don't know. That's just how it is. And the man can't do any work, but the woman can see after her children according to their rules. So anyway, where the elevators are shut down and I got to go up to the top and here's this Jewish man in all of his garb and his wife and, and they got a baby carriage with a baby in it and he won't help her because he's going to break the Sabbath. And I'm just sitting there thinking, what's wrong with this guy? So I just grabbed hold of the baby carriage and I said, I'll help you. And they're going, no, 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 no. I said, no, no, I'm going to help you. And I start moving up the stairs thinking in my mind, boy, this guy has got a, a problem, this man, you know. And he was so mad, he got to the second floor and he just walked out. <laughs> and then the woman was on the back end of this and, and she's kind of happy because she's pushing and I'm pulling and we got this baby carriage up. I don't know how many flights of stairs. And as I'm hauling this up the stairs, and getting angry at this man for not helping his wife, it dawned on me that this is religion at work. He's so religious he won't lift a finger to help his wife. And that's the same thing they face in the Bible. So anyway, I was happy as anything. Then I, I thought, this is awesome. You know, so the woman's happy. She's just, you know, getting her baby up the stairs. The guy is buzzed off somewhere. Good riddance. <laughs> So we got her, got her up to the floor that she was going to and she went on her way and she's all apologizing. I said, no, no, it's good. It's fine. I'm happy. Happy to help you. <laughs> kind of thing. But that's what religion will do. It, it, it'll put a religious meaning that Jesus never intended on the Sabbath. And so this uh, same pharisaical spirit can be seen in those who hold that believing in Jesus is a work. They'll say that, no, you, you can't do any work. You know, God has to regenerate you before you believe well did you listen to the gospel before you believed it isn't that a work did you think about it did you roll it around in your mind before you got saved did you think well oh, maybe i should believe this is that not a work see it's, it's foolishness isn't it it's putting meanings onto words that were never intended you hear the gospel you believed it and you got saved god saved you when you believed now 
They come to the parents here, and uh, verses 17, and uh, they said to the blind man again, What sayest thou of him that has opened thine eyes? And he said, He's a prophet. But the Jews did not believe concerning him that had been blind and received a sight until they called the parents of him that received the sight. And they asked them, saying, Is this your son, whom you say was born blind? How then doth he now see? That's the third time they asked the question. His parents answered them and said, We know that this is our son, and he was born blind. But by what means he now seeth, we don't know. Nor who opened his eyes, we know not. He's of age, ask him. He'll speak for himself. And these words spake his parents because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had agreed already that if any man did confess that he was the Christ, he should be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, said his parents, he's of age, ask him. So the parents are trying to avoid getting into trouble here. So the man said, well, he's a prophet. And uh, his parents' testimony is, well, he's, he's uh, our son, but you ask him. And religion will always overlook the work of God and try to put you out of the synagogue. See, the goal of religion is to get you out of the synagogue, not get you into the kingdom of God, but to get you out of the synagogue. <laughs> uh, Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, and you think everybody was happy. What did they do? They said, let's kill Jesus and Lazarus. Let's kill them both. Everybody's believing on them, so let's just kill them both and solve the problem. You think you'd get a... See, religion will miss the miracle and try to kill you. Or destroy you. Or put you out. And uh, then over in Matthew chapter 10. Or 12 verses 10 through 14. After the healing of the man with the withered hand. They had a council. They had a church meeting. And they said let's figure out how we're going to destroy him. Can you imagine if somebody got healed in here. And we had a meeting. How are we going to destroy this guy? You know I mean. I mean he's getting people healed. Let's destroy him. Because they, they were mad. Remember over in uh, Matthew chapter 12, there was a man, another man that was born blind and dumb. And Jesus healed him so that he both saw and spoke. And, and then the Pharisee said, it's only by Beelzebub, the prince of devils, that this man is well. Can you imagine? Here's a man born blind. Everybody knows it. Jesus heals him. And they say, that's the devil. Well, you know, I ran into that same thing. You've seen that video that we had in India. We didn't plan that video. You know, I was just uh, having a crusade and there was a man that was paralyzed for 25 years with a stroke, number of strokes he had. Couldn't walk. Four men carried him into the meeting, set him in a chair, and he had a little bit of Parkinson's. That was all that was moving. You could see a little bit of twitching in his hand and that was it. His face was just like, looked straight ahead, couldn't smile, couldn't talk, couldn't do nothing. Just sitting there. And I was preaching that morning on, it was January the 15th, uh, 2005, I believe it was. And I was preaching on, you must be born again. That's the message I was preaching. And I was preaching that message, and I saw that man sitting in the front, and I mean, he was just standing there, like, just frozen. Couldn't do nothing, just a little bit of twitch. And, and uh, the devil said, don't pray for that man. If you pray for that man, he won't be healed. And everybody will say, you're a fake. And I said, devil for that, that'll be the first man I pray for when I get up to praying. So as soon as I, I finished the message, I went straight to him. Laid my hands on him and I said, in the name of Jesus, be healed. He just sat there and twitched. And I thought, maybe the devil for one time told the truth. Threw me a curveball. <laughs> But, you know, I was sitting there and, and, and the kids were starting to laugh, you know, while we was praying. And, and then suddenly I got bold. And I, I, I spoke to him. And I said, stand to your feet in the name of Jesus. And I grabbed hold of him and I pulled him out of the chair. I said, I'm going to pull you out of there. I pulled him out of the chair. You can see it on YouTube. And uh, he stood up. Hallelujah. And his you know, sister, I believe it was, behind him, kind of helped him stand up and so he was standing now. And then so I started walking with him in the name of Jesus. And he started to stumble along and walk like this. Well, he'd been 25 years. So he, I, got, I got him about 10 steps and then he turned around and, and I said, come to me. So he started to stumble towards me. And then I grabbed hold of him and then the Lord said, run. So I run. 
He had no choice. I had hold of him. He had to run too. Next thing I know, he took off like a deer. Went right past me. You can see it on YouTube if you want. And he ran back and forth in the church and, and, and people were crying and, and, and just bawling because they knew this man. His uh, wife's sister had uh, been healed in one of our meetings. She had to take about 20 or more tablets every day just to keep her food down. Couldn't eat and was having difficulty. Came and got prayed for and was completely delivered. She said, I've got to get my brother into these meetings. So she, that's how he ended up in those meetings. And he got healed too. Well, you know, the interesting thing about it is the religious people, when they see that video, they say, well, that's a fake. He wasn't really sick because, because look at him, you know, all this kind of thing. He's not smiling. Well, I'm sorry he had a stroke for 25 years. He smiled later on, but, you know, I mean, they're finding fault with every little thing. Then I had people say, well, you know, how much money do you make? As if that made any difference. I said, well, if you want to know, I live in a one-bedroom apartment. Amen? Not that I begrudge anyone that lives in something different. That's just where I'm living right now. Grateful for it. Amen? <laughs> I'm not poor. I'm not over rich. I'm blessed. But, you know, they, they're trying to find fault. Well, that's an old video. Give us another one. You know, they're, they're just unbelief in religion will always try to find fault with what the miracle is doing. And, then, and then, then, then they said, oh, that's the devil. Another one said that. I said, was Jesus wrong to heal this man? Was he wrong? You know, would you correct him for doing that? <laughs> you know? And then they said, well, we know your ministry. You, you was up north and... and uh, Nobody got healed up there. I said, isn't that funny? I said, Florence Mongrand came to the meeting in Lalash and had a couple of canes. I still got her canes in my garage, for crying out loud. She prayed for her and she just dropped both canes and started walking around. Next day, walked uptown. The town built her a wheelchair ramp up her house because she used to have been a wheelchair. Sometimes she could stand up on a couple of canes and stuff like that. Well, the wheelchair ramp is still there to this day. Hallelujah. She lived 12 years after she got healed, walked all over town, testified about it. Amen. I used to tell people, I used to, they, they'd argue and I'd say, well, what about Florence? Well, yeah, because everybody knew it. Couldn't argue with it. It's what Jesus did. But religion will always find fault, and that's what they're doing here. They're interviewing the man now, and they're giving him a hard time. And so uh, the parents just said, well, you ask him, because uh, we don't want to get put out of the synagogue for this. So then... They ask him, verse 24, they called the man that was blind, said unto him, Give God the praise. We know that this man was a sinner. See, they already got him judged and juried and executed. Religious people will, will pass the sentence on you before they ever hear anything. And he answered, Well, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. But one thing I know, that where I was blind, now I see. That's the proof. That's the proof of the pudding is in the eating. I was blind, and I can see real good right now. I don't know whether he was a sinner because I didn't see him. He just put paste on my eye and, then, and, and I went and washed him. I don't even know where he is. So was he good or bad? I don't know. But I know one thing. I was blind and I can see real good right now. How come you guys are so angry? <laughs> <laughs> then they said unto him, What did he do to thee? How opened he thine eyes? That's the fourth time they asked that question. You know, some people keep asking the same old question over and over because they don't like the answer. But they don't like the answer. And so he, he's going to answer them, I told you already, yeah, four times, and you did not hear, wherefore would you hear again? Will you also be his disciples? You want to get saved? Is that what you want? <laughs> then they reviled him and said, thou art his disciple, but we are Moses' disciples. We know that God spake unto Moses. As for this fellow, we know from whence he is. We know that God spoke to Moses, even though that was uh, a thousand years ago. <laughs> <laughs> or more, God, <laughs> you know. How do they know that God spoke to Moses? Were they there? They weren't there. See, it's written in the Bible. Now, God did speak to Moses. Nobody's disputing that, okay? But some people say, well, we believe that God spoke to Moses. We believe that God this in the days of the apostles. But right now, there's a miracle looking us in the face, but we can't believe that. See, religion will, will believe the Bible, and, and I believe the Bible too. See, the difference between me and religion is I believe that Jesus, God spoke to Moses, 
God spoke to Jesus. God spoke to Peter, to Paul. And I believe that God speaks to people today too. And he doesn't contradict what he spoke to Moses or Peter or Paul. He still speak the same thing. He might put a little different emphasis on something if he needs to. But he'll still speak today. The same thing. So they reviled him. And they said, you know, they became experts. They said, we know that God spoke to Moses. Remember back in John chapter 6? Our fathers, Moses gave our forefathers manna to eat. But what sign will you give us? Jesus. Well, excuse me, there's 5,000 people eating bread and fish right now. Maybe you even had some. And you're asking for a sign as if the feeding of the 5,000 wasn't enough. See, there's no sign, there's no wonder, there's no miracle you can give to a religious person to convince them. They're always going to want something different, something more, something else. Because religion is based on unbelief. Come on. Religion will not believe. It doesn't mind believing something that you can't verify with the eye. And, now, and again, that's not to take away from the word of God. We know that God did miracles in Moses' time and Jesus' time. I mean, we, we believe that. But that doesn't stop us from believing today. Amen? That doesn't mean that every miracle that you ever see or happen is from God. But you know, I'm pretty careful when I judge a miracle. I'm pretty careful. I know there's false miracles. I know that Satan does miracles. He did it back in Bible days too. Amen? So, But I'm really careful before I say, oh, that's the devil. I want to be cautious about that. I want to really be careful before I start being judge, jury, and executioner like the religious Pharisees were. I want to really be careful about that. So they reviled him and said, Thou art his disciple. We're Moses' disciples. We know that God spoke to Moses. And as for this fellow, we don't know whence he is. And the man answered and said unto them, Well, herein is a marvelous thing that you know not from whence he is, and yet he's opened my eyes. Isn't that something? You don't know where he came from, but here are my eyes. Look at it. I can see real good. Got your little chart, you know, E, F, B. <laughs> I can see you real good now. Now we know that God heareth not sinners, but if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. And since the world began, was it not heard that any man opened the eyes of one that was born blind? If this man were not of God, he could do nothing. See, he gives him a little uh, sermon there, a little teaching. In other words, you guys haven't been able to open any blind people's eyes and you're supposed to be the ones that sit in Moses' seat. But along come this guy that you don't even know anything about and he opened my eyes and I'm looking at you right now. Instead of repenting, they got mad. See, religion will always get mad. They answered and said unto him, Thou wast altogether born in sins and dost thou teach us? And they cast him out. Put him out. Imagine if somebody got healed of blindness in here and we threw him out. Because we didn't like it. Can you imagine? I mean, I mean that's, how, that's what they did though. They just put him out. We don't want that kind of miracles thing to happen around here. So Jesus heard that they cast him out. And when he found him, he said unto him, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? And he answered and said, Who's he, Lord, that I might believe on him? See, remember, this man doesn't know that Jesus was the one that healed him per se. Because he can't see. All he knows is some guy that come along and put spit on his mud on his eyes and told him to go wash and he come back and Jesus is gone. So he's happy he can see, but he doesn't know where Jesus went and doesn't know what he looks like. So he says, well, who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? And Jesus said, thou hast both seen him and it is he that talketh with thee. So he's probably recognizing the voice now and, and he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. Now here's a little side thought. Jesus is God in the flesh. And this man worships Jesus. Now if Jesus, being a rabbi, was not God, he would have said, no, no, stop that. You know, you should worship the Lord your God and him only shalt thou serve. But he let him worship him. Amen. Because he's God in the flesh. So he lets him worship him. And Jesus said, for judgment I came into this world that they which see not might see and they which see might be made blind. And some of the Pharisees which were with him heard these words and said unto him, Are we blind also? And Jesus said unto them, If you were blind, you should have no sin. But now that you say we see, therefore your sin remains. Well, that's a strong word, isn't it? 
That's a strong word. Now, <laughs> what does Jesus say here? For judgment, for judgment I come into this world. You know, uh, there's a two-edged sword here. One side is like a scalpel that'll heal you, and the other side is like a soldier's sword that'll kill you. And the Word of God is like that. Depending on how you approach it, if you let the Word of God come into your life, it will cut off all of the sin and all of the disease and all the wrong stuff. It'll just cut that stuff right off. You know, just like if you've got a cancer on you, you want the scalpel. I don't want no one cutting me, but if I had a disease on me, I'd be saying, cut it right here, doctor. <laughs> Have at her. Get that thing off me. And you know, if your attitude to God is like that, you come to God and you say, Lord, I, I got sin, I got problem, I got issues in my life, I got addictions, I got bondages, I got habits. Lord, put your scalpel on me and set me free. Well, that, that, that's what it'll do. But if you're like the Pharisees and the religious people, you're going to get the other side of the sword. And you don't want that side. Amen. For judgment I come into the world, that they which not see might see, and they which see might be made blind. See, revelation brings responsibility. If you don't know nothing, you can't be responsible. Your little baby don't know anything. Doesn't know what it's like to commit adultery. Doesn't know what it's like to steal. Doesn't know what it's like to commit murder. Doesn't have an idea. Not the faintest idea about it. My little girl just learned what a ball was. Last night I said, said, you want to play ball? She turned and saw her ball, went over, got the ball, started playing with me. And said, ball. I was shocked. She's only 11 months. I was shocked. I think she's smart. But you know, if I said to her, don't steal, she'd look at me funny like a cow at a new gate. Doesn't know what that is. See, and when people that don't know the truth are given revelation, their eyes are opened and they become accountable. And you can either believe and receive Jesus Christ, or you can get stubborn about it like the Pharisees did, and he'll make you blind. See, the Pharisees saw a miracle right there. They saw a blind man, and they knew that blind man. His parents attended the synagogue. They knew full well that it was their kid. They're just arguing. And religion will make you argue, and you'll fight, and you'll oppose, and you'll get offended. And, and Jesus just said, well, you know, uh, those that see will be made blind. If you really want to persist, and, and again, I'm going to give you a warning, church. I'm going to give you a warning. I'm not trying to be hard, but I'm going to give you a warning. If God talks to you from the word or even to your spirit and tells you something, if you get stubborn about that and you get your hackles up and you're not going to listen and you're going to have your own way and you keep on in that, you're going to get hard and you're going to end up being blind. And God will just stop talking to you about that. I mean, it's dangerous. Because they receive not the love of the truth, strong delusion is given to them. Don't, don't be like that. When God talks, just say, Lord, I don't want to hear that, but I need to hear it. <laughs> be honest. Lord, I wish that wasn't in the Bible. I don't like it. I don't understand it. But I see it there. And Oh, God, just help me with that. See, God can work with that. God can work with honesty. But if you get stubborn and hard, you could end up like the Pharisees who could see a miracle right in front of their eyes. And it didn't just happen in the Bible. I know all kinds of people that have seen miracles and fought them and argued about them and got angry about them. And, and, and they just won't hear. And then what God will do is he won't even show you anything anymore after a while. Remember Pharaoh? How many signs did he see? Rivers turned to blood, frogs, and lice, and every kind of thing. Ten plagues. Every time he got more stubborn. The first couple times he hardened his own heart, and after that God helped him out. And hardened it for him. Don't, don't let that happen to you. When God starts talking to you, be easy to listen, quick to repent, quick to forgive. And, and the more the more pliable you are in the hand of God, the more you yield to him, the more you say, yes, Lord, then the easier it's going to get to hear from him. I mean, even in the natural, if, if, if somebody tells you something, if you tell somebody something and they get all stubborn with you, there comes a point you say, ah, forget them. Don't even talk to them. Machusta, one. 
<laughs> a stubborn head. <laughs> Amen. You ever had that, Gordon? You try to tell some, you try to show somebody something, and you really, you really want them to learn. You're trying to tell them, and, and then they start to argue and, and 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 fight with you, and then they get you know upset with you. Maybe they swear at you, and you finally say, "Okay, forget it then. I won't tell you nothing. I will tell somebody else." Amen. Amen. Some of you guys in the center, I won't talk to you now. Mm -hmm. Oh, sometimes Al says stuff to you, you don't want to hear it. Oh, why does he tell me this? You know, who does he think he is? Blah, 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 blah. Listen to it, because it's for your good. <laughs> and if you get hard, you're going to end up in the school of hard knocks more so than some of you already had. You know, learn to listen and, and to do. And, and, and the more you do, the easier the life is going to be. Uh, you know, I, I found that there's just no blessing in being stubborn. There's no blessing in that. There's no blessing in being religious. It's better to be honest with someone and just say, you know what, I don't like what you're telling me. I know I need to hear it, but I don't like it. Just uh, talk through it. Amen? Talk through it. It's like Gordon said, I, I won't repeat something. <laughs> the way he put it, though. <laughs> he, got, he got so upset with me telling him certain things. But you know what, he's here today. And he's grown as a result of it. Amen? I don't like some of the things that people have told me in my life. But you know, if I listen to it, I get better. If you don't listen to it, you'll get bitter. Better to be better than bitter. Praise the Lord. Shushwe, Mr. Tim, that little donkey, that little stubborn horse. <laughs> Amen. Don't be like a shushwe, Mr. Tim. <laughs> don't be stubborn. Praise the Lord. Anyway, God bless you. I want to pray for you now, Father. We just uh, pray. Help us, Lord God, to have open eyes and open hearts. And Lord, I thank you, Father God, that uh, you healed that blind man. And Lord, you can heal blind people today, physically, or even those, Lord, that are, that are blind to the truth. You can heal us. And we ask you, Lord God, to open our eyes that we would see what you're saying to us and help us to have hearts that are listening, not stubborn. So Father, we just pray for this today. And for all those that are listening on Facebook, we ask you to bless them. And minister to them today through this word in Jesus' name. Amen.